Genies, it's Fisher with exciting news. The Weekly Genie, the official newsletter of Extreme Genes, is here. It's your Monday morning briefing on what's happening in the world of genealogy and family history and on Extreme Genes. Get all the details of jaw-dropping stories of discovery and keep up with the latest techniques in family history research. Get to know more about your favorite Extreme Genes personalities. And it's free. Sign up for The Weekly Genie now at ExtremeGenes.com or the Extreme Jean's Facebook page. And when you do, you'll receive David Allen Lambert's top 10 tips for beginning genealogists from the chief genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Sign up today for the Weekly Genie. Grandpa stole his first buggy in 1892. Uh, I met your grandma pig slopping in 46. Oh, every Christmas, we'd visit my Uncle Fred in prison. And you have found us, America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth, on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. And welcome to the show this week. This segment is brought to you by LegacyTree.com. And our guests today are going to include a, a couple of people with very different types of stories. First of all, Craig Foster is going to be here. He's with FamilySearch.org, and he's got a great story for you, actually several little things for you to understand about customs in courting and marriage. And uh, one of these customs <laughs> is something I'd never heard of before, and you're going to be amazed by it. That's coming up uh, starting in about eight minutes or so. Later in the show, we're going to talk to Kate Eekman from LegacyTree.com, and she's been working with a client on finding the lineage of his birth mother, who was murdered many years ago. Interesting tale. How did she find the links? It's an interesting journey that you're going to learn a lot from. So that's later on. Hope you're there for that. Hey, and just a reminder, by the way, you can sign up right now for the Weekly Genie, our brand new shiny newsletter from Extreme Genes. The Weekly Genie is available through our Facebook page, and you can sign up also at ExtremeGenes.com. It is absolutely free. And when you do sign up, you'll get the top 10 tips for beginning genealogists from my good friend David Allen Lambert, the chief genealogist for the New England Historic Genealogical Society, who just happens to be with us right now. Hello, David. How are you? Hey, I'm doing great in Beantown. How about yourself, Fish? Awesome. Had an interesting experience this week. I got an email from a distant cousin who received an email from someone else who had gone up into his late grandmother's attic and recovered some real old family documents. Among them was a letter from 1815 from one of his relatives that tied into the family of us. And it referenced my fifth great grandfather not being in good health and he was gone within a year, but there was a lot of great content in it. So it was a lot of fun to see that. Well, that sounds like you found some family treasure recently then. Yes. That's excellent. Love it. Well, for Family History News, I have a very interesting story from the land down under. You know, with technology now, a lot of things that we do are online, not through paper. And of course, the census is one of those things that's been considered by the federal government to do a lot of online registration. Well, Australia is already doing it. Problem though, hackers that have now crashed the site four times, something offshore. They don't know where they're coming from, but they're definitely in Australia. But why? That's, that's the question. I'm, why would they? I mean, it's so childish. Maybe it's someone who wants to change grandma's age. I mean, because <laughs> I mean, maybe it's data mining, identity theft issues. Yeah. So it really does put a little air of caution into the wind about what the United States and other countries might do if they're going to do something like this online. Of course, you can follow Extreme Genes on Twitter at Extreme Genes, and you can follow me at DL Genealogist. All of these tweets that we're both doing are now being saved by the Library of Congress. We're part of the Library of Congress fish. So I thought. <laughs> because we tweeted? Yes, oh. exactly. So if you make a tweet and you're really not happy about somebody, remember it's being preserved for posterity. <laughs> so we thought. However, there are millions upon millions of tweets received every day. And now the Library of Congress is contemplating if they really could keep this data and preserve it. So, Well, as a taxpayer, David, let me just say, I hope not. Why do they need to create space in the Library of Congress for all these little quick tweets? Who cares? 
I know, I know, but <laughs> apparently it's one way to leave a record of the 21st century. Keep but, it online, uh, that's all. Exactly. Something more permanent than Twitter are statues. Now, yep. we take for granted when we walk through parks and whatnot, and we see a statue, occasionally stop and read them, maybe do a selfie with the statue, but now you can do so much more. There is an effort going forward called Talking Statues, and this is going to go forth in New York. This already started in Copenhagen, Denmark in 2013. They apply a QR code to a sign or a statue. That's that little digital black and white image which you scan with your phone, and now the statue will talk. Or someone will narrate a little bit of a history blurb about the person, or maybe you'll even hear a quote from the person bringing the statue to life. I think it's fascinating. No, I think it's great. And of course, they're doing that with graves already. You can get a QR code for uh, your ancestors and put it on tombstones around the country. My only concern about the gravestone QR code is that if people are buying them and putting them on stones and they don't really know the story, are we opening up the idea of genealogical erroneous material going out there permanently and then secured to a gravestone? Boy, how do you regulate that? I don't know. I don't know. That's one for other people to figure out than you and I, sir. Mm -hmm. Well, now the weeks are approaching to go to the FGS conference in Springfield, Illinois. I will be there August 31st to September 3rd, giving a couple of lectures. But I'd love to have people swing by the New England Historic Genealogical Society booth and ask about extreme genes. And I can tell them, and maybe if you have an interesting ancestor, some sort of a scoundrel you want to share, we would be (laughs) delighted to talk to you. We do love scoundrels, don't we? They leave a lot more records. They really do. And I'm finding a lot more about my scoundrels on my Facebook account, tracking down first, second, and third cousins. And I'm finding family members that haven't talked in over 80, 90 years in their generations. And I'm blending back families that had been torn apart. Yeah. They don't even remember what they were fighting about, which is the scary thing. My tip for the week is going to be using pension files a little different way. I want you to make a second copy of the pages that you've made from the archives or on an online site for Rev War through Civil War. Take those pension files and put them in chronological order with your second copy. It will essentially give you a diary in the life story of the veteran after the war. That's a great idea. I find that it's an easier way to understand the whole process of what they're doing in the pension, too. Our NEHGS free guest user database of this week includes vital records for Dutchess County, New York, Jamaica, Vermont, and Easton, Massachusetts from the 18th century through the 19th century. Try them by becoming a free guest user on AmericanAncestors.org. Well, that's all I have this week, and I'll be delighted to share more family history news with you next week, Fish. Take care. All right. Always good to talk with you, David. Thanks so much. And coming up next in three minutes, we're going to talk to Craig Foster. He's going to tell you about customs from the UK concerning courting and marriage that actually came across here to North America. And you're not going to believe some of these customs. That's next on Extreme Genes. Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com. Provide your saliva sample from home and mail it back to a CLIA certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. Well, Genies, my personal family history researcher who sends me new information day and night has sent me some incredible new records and newspaper stories lately. Hi, it's Fisher, and the name of that researcher, by the way, is MyHeritage.com. It's the hardest working service in genealogy, looking for records of your family 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yes, even while you're sleeping. How does it work? MyHeritage uses hundreds of algorithms to match your ancestors to over 5 billion records from around the world. 
the world and with 97% accuracy. That means no more wasting time figuring out whether or not a match really is a match. I hear from listeners all the time who are shocked with how much information is accurately found and then passed along. And now my heritage will translate your ancestors' names into English or any other language you like from foreign records. In fact, it works with over 40 languages. No one else does this. Whether you're a beginner or seasoned researcher, you need MyHeritage.com. You know, everybody needs a place of their own to plant their family tree, preferably one that no one else can mess with and only you can control. That perfect place is Roots Magic. Roots Magic has been a family history standard for years, and now Roots Magic 7 is on the market. It's an award-winning genealogical software program which makes researching, organizing, and sharing your family history easy. You can start from scratch or import data from other software or even family search. Roots Magic also automatically finds records relating to your ancestors from my heritage family search and soon ancestry and find my past you can use it to create beautiful charts reports and books and have you ever thought about making your own family history website roots magic can make that happen too and of course there are free videos guides and technical support to help you along isn't it about time you planted your family tree? Whether you're a beginning genie or experienced professional, Roots Magic is the perfect tool for you. Welcome back to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And this segment is being brought to you by 23andMe.com DNA. And this is very interesting. I, I went to a recent conference on family history at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. And there are all kinds of great classes that are shared there. And one of them was taught by this man who's on the phone with me right now, Craig Foster. He works over at FamilySearch.org, in fact, one of our sponsors. And Craig, nice to have you on the show. And you did a, a fabulous presentation on weddings, and particularly from the British Isles. And some of the customs that were over there that might help us understand our ancestors a little better. And some of those customs that were actually brought over to the United States, I would imagine New England and probably Virginia and the South, yes? Yes, thanks uh, for having me on. Yes, there were uh, various customs, both courting and marriage customs, that were in the British Isles. And then obviously, uh, since so many British people immigrated to New England, Virginia, all along uh, the eastern seaboard, they brought these customs with them which would be expected. And sometimes the customs, while they eventually died out in England and Scotland and that, they continued at least for a while longer over here in America. Interesting. And these don't necessarily show up in records, right? For the most part, no. Although you will find references sometimes in, uh, in old diaries or even some local histories where they'll talk about it to a degree, but not a great degree. So it's a hint here and a hint there, and it's a, a matter of piecing it all together. Sure. Now, one of those things that we're going to talk about as far as courting goes was the, the consideration of what betrothal meant. Now, I think most of us today think of betrothal as being like engaged, right? Right. But it was not that way in the 18th century. No, absolutely not. It was uh, considered much more binding. In fact, that's why when a couple were betrothed, they were supposed to do it in a public setting in front of a priest or a minister of some type and uh, in front of uh, male representatives from both sides of the family. And the reason why is because they allowed a degree of intimacy that was not allowed or we would not expect to be allowed nowadays and that is they allowed to ride up to uh, full sexual intercourse. In fact, that's why we always tell people, if you're looking for a marriage because a child was born a certain date and you know that was the first child, then you better look right up to a week or so before the child was born <laughs> for the marriage to take place because of this allowing this degree of intimacy. 
I actually found a record like that just a week or so ago on a relative, not a direct, but uh, somebody who'd been married 10 days before and then the baby was born. Right. But I, I don't know if it had to do with this or not. As long as the couple was married, that child was considered legitimate. Ah, well, tell us some more of these things. This is kind of interesting stuff. What is this thing bundling? Tell me about that. Okay, so bundling was done mostly in pre-industrial revolution times, and it took place mostly in the north of England, Scotland, Wales, and Ireland, not so much in England, particularly down in the middle in the south part of England. And this was done mostly with the agrarian or working class, mm -hmm. where they would work all day. They didn't have time to really do much courting, except at night. And and so they would come and they would, the parents and family would bundle them into the bed. Usually it was the guy going to the girl's place and they would bundle them together into bed. They would put the covers over them and then they would put a um, rolled up blanket between them or a board or something like that. Sometimes they'd even put the girl into a very large stocking type thing and tie it. <laughs> this, um, really? The idea that they could talk with each other. They would <laughs> they would talk until they just fell asleep. Uh -huh. and, but there wouldn't be any intimacy because this this was still in the courting. Yeah, stage. this is dating. This is dating, and we're talking 18th century here. Yes, this was 18th century dating <laughs> among the among the more you know the agrarian class. And um, this was brought over to New England and, and was done in New England until actually long past when it was given up in Scotland and other parts of the British Isles. And ironically, some British uh, publications even kind of looked down on the New Englanders commenting that they still practiced something like that. <laughs> Yet that's where they got it from, was from uh, their original homeland. So what made them actually end bundling in uh, the British Isles? Well, it grew out of style for a couple of reasons. One, particularly with the Industrial Revolution, came better methods of heating, and uh, so they didn't, they didn't have to uh, bundle up into bed. They were able to heat the house ah. you know, less expensively and for longer. And, and Plus, there was a change in um, courting and all of that, particularly after what uh, some historians like uh, Lawrence Foster and Peter Laslett referred to as the first sexual revolution. You know, everyone talks about the 60s being the sexual revolution, but they argued that the first sexual revolution actually took place in the 1770s, 80s. It had started a little bit earlier in some places, but particularly 1770s and 80s, and they, they looked on it all as in a different way, and they decided that bundling was just a little too risque, and it encouraged illegitimate a little too much. And so that went, and it was in reaction to this uh, first uh, sexual revolution. I'm talking to Craig Foster. He's with FamilySearch.org, and we're talking about some of the unusual customs in courting and marriage in the British Isles. Now let's jump over to the marriage side of things here, Craig. And uh, you were mentioning to me off air before we went on uh, that, that there are a lot of records that just don't show up and this is really important for people to understand if they're searching for ancestors in, in that part of the world. That's right, absolutely. Uh, and, and there are several reasons why the records wouldn't uh, show up. You know, usually when we're doing research, we, we go to the parish where the bride was from or perhaps where the groom was from. And if right. we don't find the, the marriage in the record right away, we, we decide, okay, they, they either were nonconformists or they got married in a parish right nearby. So we do the usual radius search, and of course we try to get access to nonconformist records. But you have to keep in mind that with marriage, they had to get married in the Church of England, and you know up until 1837. Right. So we, we sit there and we go, well, okay, I really don't understand it, unless they were Quakers <laughs> or something like that. Yeah. But what happened was 
there were some places where the marriages were performed. And so let me tell you really quickly, for example, fleet marriages. There was a part of London that uh, was within the sound or within the environs of uh, the fleet prison. And these um, irregular and clandestine marriages took place in this area of London. And, and there were a couple of areas right all around the same area altogether where people would go, they would get married, and uh, then uh, the marriages weren't recorded or they were put into another book. There would be a couple of books that would be available or they would change the names. And so these were quick and irregular marriages that were technically um, not they were barely legal, if that, and they were certainly uh, not canonical. You know, in other words, the church uh, <laughs> really looked down on this. Sure. There were also places out in the country, some of these uh, parishes where they were known as lawless churches. And they would be kind of the poor uh, uh, churches out there where the uh, minister was happy to do anything uh, in order to get a little bit of money mm. because they were, you know, barely making it, uh, you know, um, economically. And so they would go to these churches, and sometimes they were, sheesh, a number of parishes away or even over into another county. And then, of course, after after the laws were changed in uh, in the early 1750s, then of course you had uh, the um, the Marriage Act of 1753 changed it. Uh, people would go up to uh, to Gretna Green, which was across the Scottish border, because the Scottish laws were a little more lenient. And so couples wanting to get married and uh, uh, didn't have permission from their parents would rush up to Gretna Green for a <laughs> quick marriage. Wow. Well, it sounds like another place we have to start looking. That isn't the best news that I've heard here, Craig, because I think <laughs> most of us hope that at some point something's going to show up on a website some, somewhere. And, and you're saying maybe not. In many I'm cases, saying maybe not, because there were thousands of marriages that took place each year in the area of the Fleet Prison, and a good portion of those marriages were never recorded. Oh. Yeah, that's just one example. So sometimes you just may not be able to find your ancestor's marriage because of a reason like that. I don't like hearing things like that. But, Craig, I enjoyed it very much, especially the thing about bundling. That's absolutely insane. And, yes, it and, really uh, was kind of crazy. I've learned something today. Thanks for coming on. Appreciate it and hope to talk to you again. Look forward to it. And coming up next, we're going to talk to professional genealogist Kate Eekman from Portland, Oregon. She's with LegacyTree.com, talking about a client whose birth mother was murdered and what she did to track down her family. We'll tell you about that in five minutes on Extreme Genes. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. Zap the grandma gap .com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks.
Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chartmasters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartmasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chartmasters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartmasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. Hey, you have found us. America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. My name is Fisher, and I'm always excited to help you understand ways that people research their ancestors and get you some great stories in the middle of it as well. And we talk about the fundamental of taking what you know and taking that to what you don't know. And my next guest is Kate Eekman. She's with LegacyTree.com. She's based in Portland, Oregon. Hi, Kate. How are you? Hi, I'm doing just great. Thank you. And you've recently solved a case for a guy who had a very unique story because he was adopted because his mother was murdered. That's right. This gentleman, an older gentleman, knew only the name of his mother, who, as you said, after she was murdered, he was adopted by somebody else. And he had very little information. And he came to us and said, can you please help me find out some more about my biological family? And off you went. And what information did you have to start with? We had very little information. We knew his mother's name, Bonnie Hicks, and we were told that she was born in Ohio and had been murdered in Texas and that she had a sister named Janet. And that's all we had. Well, this is why sometimes we go to professionals. (laughs) That's very little to go on. (laughs) But I do know that the the real good ones can take the fuzz on a cat's tail and pull in the whole cat at some point. So... (laughs) Fill us in on where you went with this. Well, because all this happened after 1940, we didn't even have a census to start with. Hmm. Um, Bonnie was born after 1940. Um, her murder, of course, happened after that. So we, we started out with a name, and he thought that she was born in Ohio. So we ordered the Ohio birth certificate. And while we were waiting for it, we checked out the Texas death certificate, which was no help at all. The Texas death certificate had unknown for the names of her parents. So that didn't help us in the least. Boy, that's unusual, isn't it? Well, I suspect that when she died, maybe all she had on her was a piece of ID, like a driver's license or something. And that's all that the coroner or whoever completed the death certificate had for providing information because they had a date of birth, but they didn't have, you know, parents' names. So you ordered the birth certificate and what happened? The state of Ohio said, we don't have any record of this woman being born in this state. They checked for her name, they checked for the date, nothing matched up. So we were kind of stuck. We had no idea who Bonnie's parents were. Right, and so where did you go from there? Well, we found some newspaper articles about her death. They didn't have any more information either. And so finally, we did the old standby. I did a Google search. Oh, you're uh, kidding me. Google. Her name. <laughs> yeah, if people want to know, there's this little-known site called Google, And if you go on there, you can find lots and lots of things. Well, it was a wonderful tool because we had no idea where to look for her. So you finally just say, I don't know where else we're going to find her, but there must be her name someplace out there in in the world. And it was. We found an obituary for a man named Oswald Hicks, and it mentioned he had a daughter named Janet and a daughter named Bonnie Hicks who had predeceased him. Now, was this in Ohio? No, this was in Indiana. Okay, so they had moved, or the family had at that point, or you had bad information, right? Right, Right. and that's what we eventually learned, and I'm not going to ruin the story to tell you this, but the client had been misinformed about the fact that Bonnie was from Ohio. Okay. But we learned from this that Bonnie's father was named Oswald Hicks, but we still didn't have her mother's name. So we did uh, searching in the newspapers, and we found a newspaper notice 
that granted a divorce to Oswald Hicks from his wife, Betty, and gave him custody of two daughters. Wow. So now you got at least the, the full name of the father and the first name of the mother from a divorce record. Exactly. It was one of those tiny little notices that you find in the newspaper that just says, divorce granted to Oswald Hicks from Betty Hicks, custody of two daughters to Oswald. And isn't it great? I mean, we take so for granted right now digitized newspapers because they're just so much part of the fabric of family history research. And yet it, they've only been around for six or seven years. That's right. And otherwise, your option is to either personally go to a local library or a historical society or contact somebody there, um, some nice person at the library who's willing to do a little looking for you. Yeah, that's often the case. I've often called different local county libraries and talked to people Mm -hmm. about what they may have available. And often if you charm them, they are more than happy to go take a peek, see what they can find, and maybe even scan and send that back to you in an email, and you can have that information same day. Exactly. So you had uh, Oswald and you had Betty. Now you're trying to find her maiden name and who she was. Where did this case go from there? Another Google search. (laughs) Google had been my friend so far, so I thought I'm not going to leave it. I searched for Betty, and I also included the name of their other daughter, Janet, and that brought me an obituary for Janet's son, and it mentioned that he had a maternal grandmother named Betty Klein. Aha! But the question was, you didn't know whether that was her married name or her maiden name, right? Exactly. Did she revert back to her maiden name after the divorce? Or had she remarried? So I have to go looking again for some more records. And the Social Security Death Index, we found Betty Klein, who died in Michigan. Wrong state. You know, now we're out of Indiana. We're in Michigan. But it gave us a date of birth and a date of death, which would allow me to continue doing some more searching. And so I searched the Michigan Marriage Index for Betty Hicks marrying Mr. Klein, but I got nothing. There was no Betty Hicks marrying anybody. Okay. So what'd you do then? So I reversed the search. I said, well, let's try looking for Mr. Klein marrying Betty anybody. <laughs> <laughs> right. You can find something there. Exactly. That's how you do it. So we all know that names can be messed up. Things can be misread when you're looking at an online index. And I was hoping that was the case. So I searched for Mr. Klein marrying Betty any last name, right? and I found the record of, him, of Betty, Mr. Klein marrying a woman named Betty Brown Ricks. Ricks, not Hicks, not Hicks which told you right away that there's an error here. Exactly. And you can imagine that. Just think of how a capital, sure. you know, letter R, letter H, it can look sloppy, anybody, or printed. So now I've got a potential maiden name, Brown. I've got her second married name, Klein. But there's still nothing to verify that that is the woman who was the mother of Bonnie. So I looked through, found some marriage notices about her marriage to Mr. Klein and used that information to track her marriage through and discovered Betty living with her mother and her biological father, Mr. Brown, in Indiana. Apparently what happened is Betty married Mr. Hicks. They divorced, she remarried Mr. Klein, and uh, I found Betty's birth certificate as well, which proved who her father was. So by using census records, the 1930 and 1940 census, and Betty's marriage record and her birth certificate, I was able to prove that this was the woman who was the mother of Bonnie, my client's biological mother. Who was murdered in Texas. Unbelievable. What was his reaction to that? He was thrilled because all he had was a really horribly sad story, a mother murdered, and nobody knew anything else about her. And he went from just a a poor murdered mother to an entire family. We went all the way back to his great-grandparents we had found in the process, and suddenly he had a huge family on his mother's side that he never knew anything about. Great example of how the process works in pretty much any case, but this one was pretty dramatic. Thank you so much, Kate. Great to have you back again, and uh, look forward to talking to you again in the future. Thank you so much, Scott. And coming up next, we're going to be talking preservation with Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com, our preservation authority. You know, we've been talking the last couple of years about Cinematize, and what a great program it is. 
Well, that was until it went away. Well, a new program has come along to help you with the digitization of your old videos and home movies. You're going to want to hear what it is and how it works. We'll tell you about it in three minutes on Extreme Genes. Legacy Tree Genealogists is a proud sponsor of Extreme Genes. Based in Salt Lake City, Utah, near the world's largest family history library, we've been working with genealogists all over the globe since 2004 to track down records, find your ancestors, and the stories that bring your legacy to life. We also analyze DNA test results, help you join lineage societies, and find missing cousins or heirs to property. Legacy Tree is the recommended research partner of MyHeritage.com and is the world's highest client client-rated genealogy firm. Call us toll-free at 1-800-818-1476. Call now or register online to get a free estimate. Learn from our free genealogy tips on our blog at LegacyTree.com slash blog. Even experienced researchers can benefit from our proven and experienced staff of specialists who can bring new approaches to old problems. Legacy Tree Genealogists. We do the research. You enjoy the discoveries. LegacyTree.com. When someone asks what is forever.com, I tell them it's a new kind of digital storage, like for your photos and documents and all the family memories. And they always shoot back with, well, that's not a very new thing. There's Facebook Shutterfly Flickr. Then I say, oh, but on forever, you own all your content. There's no third-party ads, and it's guaranteed for your lifetime, plus 100 years. Do the others do that? Okay, so like I said, forever.com, a new kind of digital storage. You are the chief memory officer of your family. You get that frantic phone call about the reunion in two days and they need the slideshow. And you're ready because you use forever.com. Photos, news clippings, heck, you automatically upload the photos on your cell phone every day. You have everything digitally stored and organized where you can share it privately with your friends and family. No ads and it's permanent, guaranteed for generations. Yes, you are the chief memory officer and you have forever.com. Did you know that Family Search Family Tree is available through a powerful new mobile app experience? That's right. Now you can view, edit, and even add information to ancestors in your family tree whenever and wherever you are. You no longer need to wait to get home or make a date with your computer to view or update your family tree. You can add details to your tree when visiting with family or when capturing details from a trip to the cemetery. You can share new family history discoveries from classroom settings. You can even make the most of your time when waiting for doctor appointments or car repairs. Get started today by downloading the free Family Search Family Tree app to your Apple or Android device. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to get the Family Tree app for free. Exploring and expanding your family tree has never been more convenient. Visit familysearch.org slash tree app to download the Family Search Family Tree mobile app today. And welcome back to Extreme Genes, America's family history show on ExtremeGenes.com. It is preservation time with our good friend Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. And Tom, for the longest time, we were talking about cinematize in the early years of the show. Oh, yeah. Because that was kind of the thing for editing home videos. And then it disappeared. It was kind of taken off the market, at least as far as um, being made available for people to work at home on it. And we were really struggling to find something that might replace it. But you did find that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I was devastated. I wanted to try to see if I could get the rights for it. Because if this went away, it was going to hurt a lot of people trying to convert DVDs to, you know, AVIs and MOVs. But this new program, which you've mentioned before, called Wondershare. Yes. Oh, it's like cinematized on steroids. It's like <laughs> it's like Wondershare is an entire book where cinematized was one chapter. Well, and I got Wondershare because I took a whole bunch of home videos down to you and wound up with like over 100 DVDs uh, of these things. And I got to edit them because, of course, they're too long. There's a lot of trash in these things. And so I got the basic Wondershare. And even that has so many bells and whistles. I'm having a great time with it. Oh, it is. It's amazing. And the neat thing about this, it's it must be a young company because you call them, you email them and they get right back to you. You give them suggestions, they do stuff. 
So you give them ideas and they make things that are wonderful for you. As we've done lots of shows over the last few months across the country doing family history symposiums and different things. And clients are always coming up and saying, hey, you know, we'd love to be able to do this. We'd love to be able to do this. And one of the biggest things I've heard a lot about is now these new iPhones and Androids shoot such incredible video. Boy, don't they? <laughs> oh, it's amazing. However, the operators still aren't trained very well. Right, because everybody wants to do this thing a portrait style instead of landscape. Exactly. That's one of the biggest problems. And then they go, oh, I can't watch on my TV or I shot something sideways. What do I do? Well, because of some suggestions, our text made Wondershare now has a module where you can rotate it 360 degrees and you can also mirror it. So for some reason you shot something in the mirror and everything's backwards, <laughs> you can actually take that and make it right again. Wow, that's weird. So if yeah, I mean it's amazing. If you scan something in portrait mode like you just mentioned, you can transfer to landscape or vice versa. So what I suggest people do is they get this Wondershare, they can go in to make DVDs, MP4s, and they can even take some DVDs, for instance, we made for them, and they can put family pictures, family movies right on their iPhone. So instead of open up your billfold with all these pictures of your family, you go to a file on your phone and you actually show them the stuff on your iPod or whatever. Wow, from way back. Oh, yeah. There's even some functions on there that I'm going, what the heck is this? <laughs> and so I have to go check it out to see what these guys have done, but it's amazing. And the opportunities it gives you is great. So what I suggest, if you have some real bad video that you need to change, first go into Wondershare, rotate it, do whatever you need in there. And then when you want to go in and fix your colors, it's great to go to DaVinci, which we've talked about before. And if you get their baby module, it's free. It's totally free right. to use. In fact, I believe you even used it. Yeah, I did briefly. You know, the problem is, is that we have so many DVDs right now. We're just trying to figure out what's on those. It's going to be an early stage for a long, long time, unless I find something I really need to do something with right away. Exactly. And that's perfect because we tell people that just do it in order. You don't have to take one disc and go all the way through the end unless it's something very important. And one thing I really suggest when you're doing old film, a lot of people now want to do their own editing. So all they want is MP4s or AVIs or MOVs. I suggest you also get a DVD and a Blu-ray, even though it might be out of order because none of your films are labeled properly. It's going to take a while till you get it done. But these people are going to want to see this stuff now. And you've got older relatives that might not be around by the time you get done editing it. So coming up in the next segment, we'll go into a little bit more whistles and bells in Wondershare and how to prep some of your products before you even bring it into us or whoever's going to do your transfers for you. All right. Sounds great. This segment brought to you by Forever.com. We'll get to that in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chartmasters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartmasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chartmasters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight, they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to transfer duplication. 
Extremegenes.com. Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com, provide your saliva sample from home, and mail it back to a CLIA certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. We are back. Final segment of Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show for this week. Talking preservation with TMCPlace.com's Tom Perry. It is Fisher here. And uh, we've been talking about Wondershare. And this is the software that's kind of come along that replaced Cinematize as the best video editor that you can kind of find out there. And, uh, Tom, I'm very excited about the features in this thing. And it's also reasonably priced. And we should mention, by the way, we have no connection to Wondershare. (laughs) We're just here to share products with you that that we're excited about. And this certainly is one. Oh, absolutely. It's just like you mentioned, Cinematize. When we find a product that really does what it's supposed to do and it's a decent price, you know, we want to run with it. And Wondershare is like, you know, it's a wonder (laughs) that it's so uh, fabulous. Yes. It's just amazing how many people come up to us in shows and say, oh, I've got this stuff. And, you know, my stupid kid took my mini DV camcorder and set it on the table sideways to, you know, sure. do an interview or something like that, not realizing there's not like a photograph that you can physically, yeah. you know, move it and look at it a different <laughs> way. And so in the old days, like three months ago, we told them, well, all you can do is, you know, run it on your television, set another camera sideways and shoot it. And now that will be correct because it, Took your sideways thing, shot it sideways, now it's right. Forget all that stuff. Drop it into Wondershare. It gives you the rotation things like we mentioned. And the neat thing about it, too, is once your product's done, it allows you to convert it to be able to be used on your Android or your OS device, which your iPhones, iPads. There's so many different ways you can do different things with it. You'll go through that, and it'll just blow your mind the things. So go through some of the features that you've run across. Some of the features that you can run across besides you take the photo and you can rotate it, you can do basic things too. Like if you have some old film that you shot and it was indoors, it's really, really dark. It'll allow you to change the luminance in it so it makes it brighter and it becomes grainy, but that's the way it is. But that's the way everything is, right? Exactly. Like I've got some old stuff that my dad shot of, you know, me on my birthday party getting things ready to take out to my guests. And, I mean, you couldn't see anything. All you could see is it looked like a ghost kind of. I was dressed as Casper because it's an October thing. <laughs> but it, it wasn't that kind of a ghost. And I just took it and just really blew up the luminance on it. And I can see it's me. I can see what's going on. It's real grainy, but who cares? I had this video of my kids with Muhammad Ali. Oh, wow. And they were doing float like a butterfly to him. And he loved it. And he, and he called them over and gave them each a kiss. And uh, Eric was, I want to say, three, and Allison, our oldest, was about five at the time. And so this is incredible, but it's it's very dark in the room, and so we did the same thing, but it looks much better. We got, you know, somewhere in between where it gets grainy, but it still looks better, you know, exactly. just, just short of that. Right, and that's what you have to do. You have to look at what your end point is. Is the most important thing to make this look, you know, nice and beautiful and feel good? You know, that's what you want Da Vinci for. If you want to be able to get in it so you can see who the people are, that you don't care that it's grainy, you want to see, oh, there's grandma over there on the couch. This is, you know, great, great, great grandma, so-and-so over here that there's no other photos of her. It makes it really nice. We could talk on this for a solid week with one-hour shows, and we wouldn't even scratch the surface of Wondershare. <laughs> but just like everything else, just if you're going to be able to need to do different things, you need different software. Wondershare, basically, its most important thing is converting things converting them from MP4s to AVIs or AVIs to MP4s. Or if you have a whole bunch of DVDs that have been done, you'll turn them into AVIs, MOVs, or MP4s, so now you can edit them. We finally found what we were looking for. We did. All right. Great stuff, Tom. Thanks for coming on, and we'll see you again next week. See you then. 
This segment has been brought to you by MyHeritage.com and our friends at RootsMagic.com. Thanks so much for joining us today. That wraps up our show. And thanks again to Craig Foster for coming on from FamilySearch.org and talking about some very strange customs in courting and marriage in the UK back in the 18th century, customs that actually came to the United States. Also to Kate Eekman from our friends at LegacyTree.com talking about tracking down an adoptee's murdered birth mother's lineage. An incredible story. Story. If you missed any of it, catch the podcast on iTunes, iHeartRadio's talk channel, and ExtremeGenes.com. Talk to you next week, and remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. Family.